Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. It's great to be here. This is only my second face-to-face <clears throat> -face meeting in the last uh, 18 months, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I think hybrid will be here for a long time, but we'll learn how to do it better, better and better. So um, I have no disclosures for today, um, but I do have some thank yous. I'd like to thank the course organizers, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Nirala, Dr. Kenna, and uh, also a special shout out to the uh, leaders at Mount Sinai who are also leaders within the college, Dr. Fuster, Dr. Marine, Dr. Dangus, Dr. Lal, and Dr. Kantaris. So um, I'm from the Midwest, so I need a little uh, reorientation in terms of uh, where I am, and maybe you need a little orientation as to where I am. I grew up in Chicago, um, and I live in Indiana. If you go to Chicago and turn left, you, you'll basically end up in, in, uh, in Indiana. And as you're probably aware, uh, Indianapolis is the uh, motor uh, sport capital of the world. I'm not a particular big motor, uh, motor uh, sport buff. However, uh, the picture on the right, uh, that's where I was yesterday morning. One of my partners gave me as a gift um, this, this ride. So I was going 180 miles an hour uh, with uh, two G-forces into the turn. So uh, I feel much more comfortable today than I did yesterday. So um, another, uh, uh, Indiana is, is also the home of uh, uh, vice presidents. And I guess as, as a vice president, I should feel home there now. Um, although there's some company perhaps not to be so proud of, but uh, um, six of the 48 uh, U.S. vice presidents are from Indiana, rather disproportionate number uh, given the size of our state. But probably more importantly, uh, Indiana is also the home for many of the ACC presidents, uh, nine past presidents, if you count Charlie Fish twice, who served uh, two terms. Uh, and uh, we're very proud of the fact that we had the very first woman president, and we've had two of the five women presidents of ACC. So. Um, uh, uh, I think that, uh, that that's a great accomplishment for us. So just a little bit of background uh, as to why to talk about COVID transformation and value. Um, I'm a fully recovered interventional cardiologist, came out of the cath lab three years ago, and now practice general cardiology uh, and have the great privilege of practicing in, in really diverse situations, a quaternary teaching hospital, a suburban um, independent heart hospital, and then in multiple rural clinics around the state of Indiana. Um, I, the rest of my time I spend uh, leading a uh, national cardiovascular service line for Ascension Health, which is a large uh, not-for-profit uh, Catholic-based health uh, system in uh, uh, 18 states, 150 hospitals, 67 cardiovascular programs, uh, over 800 uh, cardiovascular uh, clinicians, and uh, we do over 11,000 surgeries and 23,000 PCIs. So through that work, I'm particularly interested in systems of care and particularly have responsibility around system quality, process improvement, and developing and implementing those systems of care. So that's kind of what will be the basis of my comments today about the pandemic transformation and value. So I'm gonna to touch on definitions uh, and then talk about the various impacts clinically, operationally, financially, and some other impacts that uh, COVID has, has brought to us. So obviously, I mean, you have been in the epicenter of COVID and you've also led all the changes that have taken place positively to deal with the pandemic, uh, both the, in terms of COVID itself, but then all the ripple effects related to care delivery. But as we started off, obviously, uh, medical resources were stretched, overburdened, we're still overburdened uh, due to the fallout of the pandemic. Some uh, bright spots of the pandemic uh, brought, to, brought to bear that uh, obviously we're all in this together, uh, emphasize the importance of globalization of science and research and accelerating technology across the globe. Uh, we've seen obviously many downsides, both directly from the illness of COVID, but uh, uh, collateral damage in terms of reducing um, the likelihood that people will go to the emergency room or to the office or continue their chronic care. And we've seen the mortality rate, particularly related to cardiovascular disease, 
increase um, uh, due to the fact that people were not getting the care that they needed in a timely fashion. The pandemic has also exposed some of the uh, dark underbelly of medicine, particularly the health inequities and the problems with social determinants of health that we've just not done a very good job of addressing in the past. We have seen a rapid shift to virtual patient care and implementing telemedicine. Um, obviously, the tremendous economic impact of the pandemic early on affected not only health systems, uh, but also our patients directly, some losing their health care uh, benefits and coverage, exposing them to great risk. And then as our health systems are uh, recovering, they're faced with uh, digging out of the financial losses and very importantly, as we'll see in a little bit, the, the issues and the challenges related to the workforce. So in the spring of last year, ACC as an organization and, and, and each of us in our own health systems and environments, we had to face this uh, issue about is our goal to return back to normal, but when we stepped back and really thought about what the impact of the pandemic was, we realized that there were so many problems in healthcare and the delivery of healthcare that maybe getting back to normal was really failure. Really, we needed to strive to do much better than that, and this was an opportunity to seize the moment and really push towards transforming care and improving the delivery um, as which, which would be best for patients. So there's many definitions for care transformation. I think these are seven important uh, elements that make up those definitions. I think first and foremost is the issue of patient-centeredness. It's a term we throw around all the time. Um, but when we um, put the patient at the center of every decision uh, that we make, uh, that obviously will be beneficial for all, not just for the individual patient. Uh, we've heard a lot this morning about the importance of moving upstream in our disease states um, all the way to basically uh, in the womb. Uh, and this emphasizes that our healthcare system has been really um, focused on sick care and not on prevention and well care. This is a key part of care transformation. Leveraging technology and innovation, leveraging uh, digital information to really use the power of the information age to better manage patients and population health. Um, building on something that cardiology has been particularly good at is the team-based approach, integrated uh, structures of care using virtual care to be able to extend uh, our reach, both to push out uh, to reach the patients where, where they are and allow them to reach in to receive the specialized care that they need. Although we take care of patients one at a time, we do also need to think about as a society delivering our care uh, from a population standpoint and really addressing the health of our communities. Uh, again, heard, heard about the importance of that in terms of policy making, et cetera. And then lastly is to change the incentive uh, uh, arrangement in terms of what drives a lot of decisions and a lot of implementation of care. We really need to move away from a fee-for-service structure to one where we're really rewarding uh, outcomes rather, rather than just doing things on a volume basis. So in terms of defining uh, value or healthcare value, um, obviously simplistically value is outcome divided by cost. But in healthcare, it's a little bit more complicated because that outcome is really made up of the broad and complex topic of clinical quality, patient experience, and increasingly so, equity. And then in terms of cost, it's not just dollars. It's also about resources and where those resources are best used, the opportunity costs related to using those resources, and probably the most important um, uh, currency of the realm now for at least the practicing clinician is time. And that is so important when we think about the well-being of our care teams in terms of uh, uh, respecting and protecting their time. So even before the pandemic, there were a lot of drivers in place uh, with respect to care transformation. We had just never gotten there. We'd never pushed there, um, largely because of the payment system. Uh, we things were sort of the rules were defined and that's the that's the way we that's the way we practiced but obviously it was a brewing big financial crisis in healthcare um, uh, value based care was something we talked about but we never really acted upon although if you look you'll see that about 50% of all uh, patients now are in some form of um, a payment structure where uh, their outcome does impact uh, how their providers are paid 
And then there's simply the explosion of technology and innovation. Um, we're now part of the Internet of Things or Internet of Healthcare. Uh, we see the uh, great potential of artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence in terms of being able to modernize what we do and join the rest of the world in terms of the economy and every business and everything else that we do that relies upon the information um, uh, world. And then COVID came along as the great disruptor. Um, obviously, it disrupted what we did. But in many ways, it's the great uniter also because it's brought together these crises and these factors in a way that now lets us look in a different light and what is the best way that we can deliver on value for our patients, for our community, and for our society. So just to start off talking about some clinical uh, aspects. So what we learned early on is that um, COVID is, um, is something that uh, we can actually sort of predict who is going to have the trouble from a cardiovascular standpoint. Uh, we know that their risk is related to their overall um, clinical risk, and there's a gradient of that risk, and that's dependent on the type of underlying um, cardiac disease that they have, the number of cardiovascular diagnoses, their severity or stability at baseline, and then various disease modifiers, which are the traditional uh, cardiovascular risk factors that we know. This is an infographic from uh, an article related to prioritization of vaccines, but it very nicely uh, laid out this gradient of risk uh, in various categories um, and, and really made the, made the point that we can predict those people who are really going to have the most problems, both in terms of getting COVID, but also in terms of what their outcomes from COVID are going to be, so we can anticipate that. One factor that came you know, painfully obvious during the pandemic is the importance of the social determinants of health. And although we focus a lot on the, the, the clinical care aspects and, and delivering uh, the great science and clinical science that we heard about this morning, uh, the vast majority of the outcome of an individual, <clears throat> or for that matter, their communities, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is really dependent on the socioeconomic factors, their physical environment, where they live, where they work, uh, their health behaviors, things that they may be able to modify. Um, but COVID really highlighted that these underlying issues, many of which are societal, are so important in terms of what the final outcome is going to be. These are things that we need to address in addition to applying the clinical sciences and uh, great therapeutics that we have. Underlying this as well is the issue, uh, the disparities related to healthcare uh, on the basis of race and ethnicity. Um, no secret to all of you here, um, tremendous differences in outcomes depending on race and ethnicity. And these are really markers that, uh, again, speak to the socioeconomic status, the healthcare access, and exposure within uh, one's environment, whether it's at work or at home or just their environment in general. Um, you were also on the front lines and, and know all too well that initially when COVID struck, we saw this plummeting of, apparent uh, plummeting of number of people with heart attacks and other acute um, heart problems not coming to the hospital. And the hospitals were, were empty as uh, um, both by design in terms of trying to make room for anticipated COVID uh, patients who were coming in but also because patients were not coming to the uh, emergency room. Initially, there was a, a sense, a false sense that, uh, well, this is great. Maybe people are, they're, you know, they're working from home, they're getting more time to exercise, they're eating better, they're losing weight. Uh, maybe this, we're really sort of seeing this as a good thing. But obviously that was not the case. What we saw uh, really was that people were staying away. They were staying out of the emergency room in the hospital because they were afraid to come come to those places. And frankly, we were messaging not to come, and we were telling them not to come. Um, the data on the right is from Ty Gluckman and his group at Providence Health, which is a large integrated health system on the West Coast in 11 states. And as you can see, uh, coincident with the beginning of the pandemic, sudden drop in the number of STEMI cases that were, were occurring across almost 15,000 uh, patients during this period of time. And during this period of time, in addition to uh, the number of cases going down, uh, those who did come, the mortality was increased by over 50%. So the, the worst of all worlds. And as we later found out, 
Uh, these people were dying at home. They were having strokes at home. They were having fatal myocardial infarctions at home. What we don't know is the ones who had myocardial infarctions at home or strokes at home who have not yet come back into the healthcare system, and we don't know what uh, pressures that's going to create. So this was not confined just to MI or to procedural care. This is also um, in Dr. Libby's institution and, and family of institutions at Mass General and, and at the Brigham. Um, data from almost 6,500 patients, you can see the sudden precipitous drop in utilization and hospitalization um, uh, during that time. Now, paradoxically, those patients stayed in the hospital for a shorter period of time, probably because we made a concerted effort to get them out of the hospital during the pandemic, and also, sadly, because they were probably dying in the hospital. The mortality rate almost doubled uh, for people who were hospitalized during that time. Again, some of this was of our own doing. We were telling people to stay at home. We were protecting resources in the hospital, knowing that there would be uh, great demands of those with COVID who were coming in. And something that was really, as we'll see in a minute, um, something that we had to learn how to do differently, there wasn't immediate access for those people with chronic disease uh, states in terms of continuing their chronic disease management, the, uh, essentially for a several week period of time outpatient care shut down as well. Well, for, fortunately, we learned how to walk and chew gum at the same time. This is uh, data from our institution, uh, or our, our set of institutions, 67 cardiovascular programs, uh, looking at utilization over that period of time and the various, when the various surges hit. And as you can see, um, there we had the same kind of dip in, in terms of acute procedural care that then plateaued out. But fortunately, as the uh, winter surge occurred, which was actually many more patients, we were able to sort of keep going uh, by organizing better and understanding how to take care of these patients and also how to expedite their care better, so be able to deal with that. And we also did a better job of educating the patients. This is an infographic from uh, CardioSmart uh, in terms of um, telling people giving patients the, uh, the tools that they need to understand what are the things that I need to uh, seek acute care about and how should I uh, seek that care, um, not to just ignore uh, or be afraid to go to, the, go to the hospital. COVID has created its own um, uh, long-term illness. Uh, most of you are familiar with this as well. Uh, the development of long COVID or, or what's now called post-acute sequelae of COVID. Um, this may be present in 10 to 15 percent of uh, patients. This was demonstrated in a series of Swedish healthcare workers looking at their seropositivity and then measuring their uh, symptoms uh, that may be lingering out to eight or more months, um, some which are mild, some which are, are uh, uh, significant and debilitating. And many of these patients have symptoms that are cardiovascular symptoms. And we will see them in our clinic. We're seeing them, seeing them now. And they, they have to be separated from the underlying cardiovascular conditions that they may already have. Seeing a lot of patients with uh, autonomic dysfunction uh, manifest as POTS syndrome. Uh, some of this may be also a product of uh, delayed presentation. And some have speculated that we're in for an epidemic of CHF or arrhythmias ventricular arrhythmias. We were talking about this at dinner last night. We may not have seen the, the rest of the iceberg yet, but uh, Clyde Yancey and Greg Farno uh, have written, a, written an editorial about uh, predicting this epidemic that may be coming. We may be getting to see part of it. Um, as a result of COVID, um, our mortality uh, uh, rate, our longevity as a country has gone down by a year. That hasn't happened in, in many decades. And uh, um, the, um, the epidemiologists and the actuaries, they look at something called expected death rates. And for the year of 2020, our expected death rate was up by 23%. And this was disproportionately seen in communities of color. Um, but not all of these deaths were explained by COVID directly. Some um, were probably related to other uh, disease states, such as diabetes, Alzheimer's, hypertension, uh, underlying uh, malignancy, things, things like that. And none of this happened at, the, at, at a uh, smooth cadence. This happened at a different rate in different places around the country, uh, mimicking the, um, the, the rise and fall of the uh, case rates uh, as we saw uh, throughout the year. COVID had significant impact on operational um, 
factors, uh, your hospital and your hospital system um, certainly was uh, highlighted uh, in national and international news in terms of how you adapted to uh, the, the COVID crisis and what new things you did to, to cope and to, to stay afloat. And during this time, we came, became quite uh, creative. Uh, old dogs can do new tricks. We saw uh, increased use of CTA and uh, really understanding that that was an option to perhaps not take people to the cath lab, minimize exposure that way. Use the same day discharge to get people out of the hospital after PCI or uh, EP devices. Um, using non-stress testing instead of uh, traditional functional stress testing to reduce exposure to staff. Likewise, using limited forms of imaging uh, with echo or point of care ultrasound to limit our, our very valuable um, staff, uh, echo staff, who are really right there, right next to the, to the patient uh, uh, in the intensive care unit. Um, using CTA, again, as a way of looking at the heart for things that we would tr traditionally do with TEE during cardioversion or looking for left, uh, left atrial appendage uh, thrombi. Changing the way we interacted with patients and our colleagues through e-consultation and video consultation and essentially really pivoting chronic uh, management of patients with EP devices from an in-person uh, entity to now almost exclusively remote, uh, remote monitoring. And then heart failure building on the uh, programs that already were in place uh, in terms of uh, heart failure clinics. So this is just an example of one way we quickly pivoted to uh, different ways of doing things. This is data of same-day discharge after PCI uh, in our system over 15 months. And as you can see, we went from a baseline of about 15%, which is the NCDR median um, uh, average for same-day same day discharge, to a high of almost 40%, which where it stays today, an 80% increase in utilization. Obviously, this, was, um, this could happen because of transradial uh, intervention, use of vascular closures and building uh, systems of care with uh, very specific algorithms in terms of how to manage these patients safely and coordinating their care in terms of getting them out of the hospital. Um, another, another byproduct of the uh, COVID and the pandemic and managing it has been the, uh, the rise of virtual care. And virtual care is, is, a, is a broad concept. It uh, entails individual monitoring with wearables and implantables, uh, re remote patient monitoring, something that you know certainly we've had experience in advanced heart failure clinics, but that has been able to be uh, increased in its utilization in terms of following more, uh, uh, more routine uh, care and uh, allowing more touches uh, with a patient in, along their way, and also incorporating patient reported outcomes in their remote monitoring, uh, which, is very, which is very important in terms of uh, modifying the way that we do things. Laying artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence on top of this for analytic purposes and creating clinical decision support uh, mechanisms. Using telehealth, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, uh, connecting the patient and the provider or connecting the care team together uh, so that that, would, that didn't become sort of a geographic or, or time-related thing. You can bring experts and everybody who is involved in the care of the patient together in a virtual way and really uh, accelerate and, and facilitate the management of difficult patients. Uh, we've all had experience uh, in terms of what happened last year within really a two to three week period of time. We moved from utilization of telehealth to engage patients from the single digits, low single digits, really reserved for mental health services or rural health services to ubiquitous use in 90% of our patients. Now that's trailed off and has kind of come back to a steady state of about 20 to 30% and there's uh, several drivers for that. Patient preference is a big one. Uh, complexity of patients' problems in terms of being able to deal with that over the, over the phone or the video payment obstacles, which uh, right now are somewhat threatened. They, they may, uh, payment support for telehealth services may uh, fade away as the uh, public health emergency is lifted. Um, we were just involved with ACC being in uh, uh, Washington, D.C. virtually this past weekend advocating for maintenance of uh, support 
for telehealth services because we think there's great need and potential uh, going forward in terms of uh, being able to deliver value. And there's barriers, and some of those barriers, again, play back to the social determinants of health, age, in terms of facility with technology, access to broadband, rural locations, and then, and then other determinants as well. I mentioned remote patient monitoring earlier, um, and, and this is a very busy slide, but I think the, the important aspect of it is, is we can take remote patient monitoring from a place where it has really been util utilized in advanced uh, heart failure and apply it to different parts of our practice that requires very specific patient selection, education of the patient, uh, making sure we're capturing the right data, using the right platforms and that we teach the patients how to do that, having the right analytic support so that we're not just getting inundated with noise of data and information uh, coming back. I mean, we have uh, implantable pulmonary artery pressure monitors that could literally give you 10,000 pieces of information in a month. How do you sort through all that uh, information? And how do you package it in a way that then the clinician uh, can then come up with the right action plan to deal with a specific patient. But great, great promise in this. Uh, we, we heard and saw uh, some of the great uh, things that are happening with advanced imaging, particularly related to uh, cardiac CT and CTA. Uh, and then going the next step, overlaying artificial intelligence to facilitate the reading and interpretation of those studies so it makes uh, more efficient. Gets the brings brings the answer directly to the to the clinician, reduces cost, and as we've seen, increases uh, accuracy as well. Um, many financial uh, uh, perturbations during the during the pandemic. Uh, this is sort of a macroeconomic view uh, of that. Uh, earnings, hospital earnings, went down on average by about five percent. And when you add back in the governmental support through the CARES Act was still about 1.2% lower than it had been in past years. Hospitals and health systems are kind of like grocery stores. They operate on a very low margin, uh, typically ranging from 1% to 2%. That number was knocked down by 20%, uh, really, really challenging many uh, individual hospitals and systems in terms of uh, being able to pay their workforce, retaining their workforce, and, st and staying afloat. We're still seeing the impact, uh, although at its peak, uh, OR volumes were down significantly, ER volumes were down by a third. We still haven't recovered all the way yet, even though our hospitals are full. And our hospitals are full because we have patients who are sicker and staying longer. Expenses related to the delivering care have gone up. The inflation of healthcare is ex has again accelerated a lot of this driven by drugs, some of which specific to COVID, which are very expensive, other supplies, and increasingly labor. Um, you, you all know that uh, uh, with the nursing shortage and the staff shortage, um, there's been a great pressure on um, on uh, uh, on their on their reimbursement on their pay in terms of increasing things. Uh, but as an industry, huge, huge losses. But there were some winners, some, some systems, including yours, which uh, did well. Uh, and that was because you were well organized and well prepared and, and very focused and had great leadership. Uh, some of that driven by higher reimbursement for the complexity of care that the COVID patients presented with, very aggressive management and keeping your teams intact. Actually, the systems that were most successful were those who did not have extensive layoffs and kept their, kept their staff in place so that they were ready to rebound and take care of patients as they came back to the hospital. We pivoted to outpatient care and recognizing how important that was, was important uh, for survival. Consolidating services, making the tough decisions, especially in, in rural hospitals where they may really, did, really, really not make sense from an economic standpoint um, and trying to balance access versus, uh, versus the cost of uh, delivering care. And then obviously the uh, investments uh, did pretty well during that period of time, which helped support some of the, uh, the bigger and larger systems. But we have challenges ahead, um, uh, big ones. The volumes, as I said, have been slow to return. Uh, the shift to outpatient care, just from a financial standpoint, is more of a challenge. Cost of care is more expensive. Federal support for, um, 
for health care, uh, some of the added uh, add-ons that were in place in response to the pandemic, they will come to an end, and particularly telehealth coverage, uh, one that we, we're really strongly advocating to preserve, as well as a change in payer mix. We've seen a large number of patients enter the public payment arena, whether it's moving on to the exchange system or, or at a state level to Medicaid. And then, as I mentioned before, patients are sicker, they're more complicated, the case mix index in the hospitals are higher, and the biggest threat is that we have a shortage of uh, qualified uh, staff who are really the first responders there at the bedside, the nurses and the, and the cardiovascular technicians. Um, but some, some uh, industries did well through this, and the, uh, no, no surprise, the insurance uh, industry did well, and that, that's obviously intuitive. Uh, they were not having to spend as much money. People weren't having procedures done. They weren't in the hospital. Uh, their medical losses were lower. Um, they saw a shift of maybe some of the most vulnerable patients, again, into the public uh, payment arena. Uh, we saw deferral of some of the most expensive care, whether it's in cardiovascular or oncology care. And then there was uh, support for people to still pay their health care premiums, even though uh, there, there wasn't a lot being paid out as a result of that. Uh, coincident to all of this has also been the uh, insurers have been um, not standing still either. They realize this moment is a game changer also and are now building their own tele telehealth networks to function in terms of disease management and also to operate as gatekeepers going forward um, uh, to address utilization. Um, shifting to value-based care and again paying, paying for results rather than paying for simply for volume. Uh, we saw the vulnerabilities that, that were exposed. Um, we've shown that the medical community can pivot and organize as teams and quickly respond to uh, a very difficult, disruptive time, leveraging technology and innovation, particularly telehealth, and accelerating this shift from outpatient to, uh, or inpatient to outpatient, um, and uh, really this proof of concept around team-based care uh, is, is really a, you know, a fundamental aspect of, of moving towards value. So I'm just going to touch on some other uh, related impacts of COVID. Um, much more in uh, expertise of many other people, but uh, obviously COVID also uh, had a major impact interrupting clinical research in particular, just the logistics of it in terms of having patients um, uh, being able to be enrolled in trials and following patients in trials. This was a focus of a round table that was put on by Harlan Crumwalls and Jim Januzzi um, in May of, um, of last year and talking about the impact on doing clinical research and really focusing on balancing the immediacy, the need for knowledge, be able to use technology to get that knowledge, incorporating the voice of the patient, patient reported outcomes, but being careful of that we were not, um, you know, speed can sometimes uh, dilute uh, the veracity of the, of the information, balancing the, 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 the need for speed with the need for accuracy and curating uh, the information carefully. Uh, a good example of this is, is actually the GUIDE HF trial, or a good, a good example of the impact of COVID on clinical research. So GUIDE HF was a study uh, that was started well before the pandemic, and it really focused on looking at the value of re remote patient monitoring in terms of outpatients with uh, uh, compensated congestive heart failure, class two, class three heart failure. And what was fascinating about this study is that COVID directly affected the results of this trial. And pre-COVID, it was very clear that the remote patient monitoring seemed to help post uh, and during COVID, there didn't seem to be a difference. And that wasn't a failure of the remote patient monitoring. It was the fact that, again, patients were not going to the hospital. They were not going to their follow-up care. They were not following through on their uh, chronic disease management. Um, in ACC and certainly in the other uh, large professional cardiovascular societies, uh, AHA, STS, uh, European Society, registries are really the, the language of quality and the language of, of results uh, in terms of uh, measuring what we do. COVID dramatically affected these as well. Um, we don't have a way of really building in as yet, we'll have to do it in retrospect, the impact of COVID in terms of risk adjustment, 
Uh, we don't understand all the interplay between COVID and the traditional parameters that we measure in the, in the registries. We have incomplete data, uh, largely because there were staffing shortages. We weren't, be, we weren't able to import data uh, e exclusively electronically. That is being improved as we increase uh, the ability to automatically um, acquire data um, on patients from EHR or from other automated systems in the hospital. Uh, as I mentioned before, the complexity of illness skewed results uh, within the registries. There are late unknown biological effects that we have yet to see that probably will come out of the registries in terms of understanding what happened there. Uh, new specific COVID-related data elements have been added specifically to NCDR and also to the Get With the Guideline registries, uh, which will provide important insight in terms of how to manage cardiovascular care long-term in these folks. So I'm going to turn lastly to a, a very important topic and that of clinical burnout. Obviously, before the pandemic, we already had an epidemic of burnout with uh, uh, upwards of one out of four clinicians reporting significant burnout um, uh, even before COVID. But after COVID, that incidence doubled. And in the cardiovascular team members, the nurses, the technicians, the frontline staff, that increase was even, was even greater. So we have to address that, be realistic about it, and in addition to uh, solve some of the problems related to COVID, we have to address the environment that we work in, and in particular, uh, the work environment, eliminating the burdens that, uh, uh, that all clinicians face in terms of trying to do their job, creating a, a culture of professionalism, uh, providing uh, opportunity for engagement, respecting what each of us do, and providing leadership opportunities, and then building on self-resilience -res and self-leadership uh, through empathy and removing some of the stigmas related to mental health that healthcare workers have um, uh, to make it easier for them to, to find a way to get the help that they need. Um, our healthcare professionals are in a critical situation right now. We, you know, through the pandemic, uh, you know, more than 3,600 healthcare workers died as a result of doing their job, and worldwide, more than 100,000. A quarter of nurses are uh, thinking about leaving um, practice, and, uh, and another quarter have significant PTSD. 30% uh, of nurses are over the age of 60, and by uh, just by attrition, will be leaving uh, will be will be leaving the, the workforce as well. And unfortunately, the pipeline is very thin. Only about 8% of new nursing students want to go into direct patient care bedside nursing. So we face this tremendous, uh, tremendous crisis in terms of nursing staff, uh, technical staff. Same is true with cardiologists. There are more cardiologists retiring than there are coming out of training by uh, almost a, a, a factor of two to one. So every year, it's anticipated over the next five to 10 years that we'll lose more 500 cardiologists per year net in terms of those who are coming in unless we expand uh, ACGME uh, approved training programs and, and think of other ways of shortening training and bringing more uh, clinicians in. Um, since we're in New York and since this is the top 10, uh, I think probably best to close with a, a fellow Hoosier, uh, David Letterman's uh, top 10 takeaways regarding COVID. So COVID has been both a negative and a positive uh, disruptor. COVID has revealed the strengths and weaknesses of our current healthcare delivery system. It's exposed the inequities in our system and also the importance of social determinants of health. Uh, COVID has threatened uh, an already bad problem with uh, clinician well-being. COVID has pr promoted innovation and digital uh, transformation on, on the uh, bright side. Uh, it's launched uh, virtual care. It's enabled use of remote patient monitoring and AI-driven care. Um, it uh, has, is in the process of reshaping our, our clinical workforce. Um, this is probably the biggest challenge we'll have going forward, uh, but it has accelerated our move towards value uh, and is driving care transformation. Just a plug for ACC, many resources specific to COVID, but many resources around the issue of care transformation and moving towards a state of value that uh, uh, the uh, COVID hub is a good example of that. And I'll just end saying that uh, COVID is a, is a global problem uh, with global impact. 
It's taught us new ways to deliver cardiovascular care, and we'll uh, learn new ways going forward as a result. It's exposed the weaknesses of our healthcare system, but it's shined a light on the problems that now give us a chance to be able to uh, correct them. Um, but it's created these opportunities in terms of pushing transformation and care delivery. So happy to stop there, and we'll ask questions later.